Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we are speaking to the Editorial Brains Trust behind Rubido Press's latest collection, Cipriana Old World. Specifically, that would be Dr. Al Cummins, Jesse Hathaway-Diaz, and Dr. Jen Zart. Okay, let's try for the first time. I was going to call it a three-way, but actually there's four of us, and uh, also that's an inappropriate thing to say. But this week we have Dr. Al, Dr. well, not really Dr. Jesse, Dr. Al, Jesse, and Dr. Jen. How are you all? (laughs) Hello. Hello. (laughs) Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so for people listening along, we have Al and Jesse in New York, and we have Jen in Seattle. So uh, let's let's experiment and see how all of this goes. We are here to talk about your new amazing book, which I want to call Too Many Cyprians, an Olympia Dukakis film, because I absolutely (laughs) adored the polyvalence and the use of different languages and actually picking up the different strands of Cyprian's hagiography. So... What we'll do, and I think, uh, and I think, as we kind of learn the rules as we go along, uh, if there's a question, like for instance, Jesse, if I ask you, if I asked you what it was like to grow up a bookish Englishman, you can like hand that question over to Al, and and same. So I'm going to start by throwing out questions to the group, and uh, and we'll go from there. So Cyprian's hagiography, go. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. Begin at the beginning, maybe. <laughs> So on a, the uh, assumed official story, and I say official because he is no longer on the, the official Roman feast calendar, and therefore the stories are not as promulgated as they used to be, but we're talking 304, the Martyrs of Nicomedia, right? Um, so Cyprian, and the earliest account of this is one of the translations that is in the book. It is, um, yes. Yeah, the, the acts of uh, Cyprian and Justina. Um, which we have uh, a translation of in, in Cipriana by uh, the, the, the wonderfully bearded uh, Matthew Bar- <laughs> Barclay, um, uh, which, he, as he points out, is itself, uh, shall we say, uh, mirroring uh, the earlier acts of Paul and Thecla. And uh, indeed, it's, it's nice to see that uh, Justina gets uh, um, her own sort of uh, inspiration as, uh, from, um, from Thecla as a fellow uh, 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 you know, lady saint that goes around punching creeps. Which yeah, is there's, nice a, there's, a, there's a quite a collection of um, magician in the beauty or beauty in the beast tropes in that time period. Um, but the, the long and the short of it, that Cyprian was a pagan magician who uh, was either hired or he himself fell in love with Justina, either hired to do love uh, magic binding to Justina so that um, Mr. A, who I can never remember his name, can have him, have her. Um, that would be a totally different story if it was a him. Uh, <laughs> And uh, through the virtue of the sign of the cross and her virginity, she rebukes the devils that are sent. And Cyprian is so impressed by this that he converts to Christianity, eventually becoming a bishop. In some versions, she becomes an abbess, and they are lifelong companions in the power of Christ. Um, When they are old, they are through the lovely saint-making period that is the Diocletian epoch. Um, where there's just thousands and thousands of Christians being killed. So the church made thousands and thousands of saints. They are um, boiled in a cauldron together. She is beheaded first because uh, Cyprian believes that if he is head- beheaded first, that she could not stand it. It would cause her anguish and that she might not enter uh, her death with nobility. So she gets off first, him second, and a passerby, uh, Theotistus, uh, who is also a saint now, uh, is so moved by their devotion to their faith that he converts upon the spot. So you have uh, a hieromartyr, which is uh, Cyprian being a bishop, you have a virgin martyr, and you have uh, a martyr uh, of faith in the moment, which is impressive. So the three of them have received accolades in, in, in Orthodox Christianity. It's primarily Cyprian and Justina that receive the most uh, uh, adoration and cultic practice, especially... Um, in the New World permutations, which are almost always coming out of Iberian and uh, specifically Iberian, uh, Gallego, uh, Catalan, and Portuguese versions of the books of Cyprian and the practices around them. 
Did I ramble enough there? Yeah. Okay. No, it was good. Well, that's the. Uh, it, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the sort of typology about how there there's an echo of a kind of um, male female crime fighting duo form uh, yeah. in in the in the hagiography because I think that is a piece. That, typology is something I think when we read about these things we are likely to miss that this was a uh, way of indicating to people who are hearing the stories the. Um, where they fit in a cosmology and kind of uh, what they mean. So uh, what 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 I like about Cyprian, uh, what I like about his hagiography is that he kind of has two. He has this hagiography, as we've discussed, where there's the crime-fighting duo in the cauldron. And also, it's a likely story, to be fair. It's like, oh, no, you cut her head off first. She'll be too upset. I'm like, hmm, you're, yeah. you're sticking to that, I see. Uh <laughs> The uh, the other part of it is, and, and this is what I think is, is remarkable about the book. So we have uh, the formation of Cyprian and, and Justina as, as saints. Uh, and then he has a kind of, him in particular, at least as we go north, which we're about to, uh, he has like a an afterlife hagiography. He had a very exciting afterlife, uh, which is how he's ended up. I guess such a uh, such an important shape in in a lot of traditions across you know a third of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, do, let's take let's take the story from and this is kind of leading into how how do we get to the north? Let's put it this way, because when we go through the book, uh, we have names of texts in sort of the Scandinavian area that well. Magical books end up essentially being named after Cyprian in the sort of 15th, 16th century. So how do we get from the hagiography and the beginning of what used to be called the Dark Ages to his appearance in the North? Well, the point of interest for me and all of that, too, is that um, I think it's worth clarifying what is meant by a book of Cyprian or the book of Cyprian um, with exposure to the, the Spanish diasporic versions of the books of Cyprian as they come across and sold in candle stores and, and, and Xeroxed pamphlets. Um, there's not one true book of Cyprian. There's many, many of them in their collections of folk magic. Sometimes there are recounts of a story of Cyprian appearing to a monk in the 11th century or the 14th century or the 16th century and saying, this is the book that was handed to me by the devil himself. And here's how you do these things. Um, so it's often a channeled book at that time period, but, I think it's also important to to understand the context. Um, there is a history of referring to any famous uh, object by its most popular brand name. So just as we refer to Xeroxing something, uh, the books of Cyprian, in effect, become any book of magic can become a book of Cyprian. In fact, the Heptameron is, is often uh, stripped of its original title and just called the, the treasure of St. Cyprian in Mexican pamphlets um, in the thirties and forties and fifties. So I think, and I think from this, um, this, this modeling that we can see of, of those kind of processes, we have, we have a rubric of sorts. We have a metric for analyzing how this was going on centuries before as well. Uh, It's not exactly the same geography. People's languages are not similar, but the, the, the overall processes that we're seeing happening in terms of, uh, uh, print literature, um, uh, illicit print literature at that, mm-hmm. um, are very similar, I think. And so we're getting this kind of mixture of um, an aspect of the historiola of, of the legend itself. After all, um, in some accounts of the, 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 the you know, the, the origin, the, the superhero origin story, uh, the books are not burned. The books are given to the youth, mm-hmm. um, which is <laughs> a rather strange <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. a, 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 a piece that's kind of a throwaway thing, but it allows for the idea that uh, whatever the the book that you know you found uh, in some dodgy pub that a, a guy with a shaved head, you know, attempting to avoid ecclesiast, you know, attempting to ensure that he would receive e- ecclesiastical court law if he was caught doing this, was offering and saying this was definitely the book of Cyprian. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is you know coming out of dreams and into. Uh, the hands of people furtively swapping these things under counters. So we get Cyprian arising as a patron of magical books themselves and the act of writing down magic, which is uh, just 
from the early days of the colonization of, of, the, of the New World is, is heavily there, that the books that were brought over were magically referred to as Ciprianios, as books of St. Cyprian. Regardless of whether or not he was the original author, he was their patron by the virtue of the fact that there was black ink on page that was magical. And if you're writing in this time period, it was common to, to bless all things, including the ink, and you need a saint to bless something if you're worried that God is going to strike you down for writing things about the devil. Yeah. So uh, Cyprian blessings of ink and things like this are some of the oldest things we find in, in Portuguese and uh, Mexican, uh, Port- Brazilian Portuguese, uh, and Mexican Spanish invocations of the saint as well. So I think there's something to that as well. But moving back to the point of moving northward, Al, do you want to... Right, right. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting when we end up talking about ink because it's not exclusively manuscript copies that uh, are used to, 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 to bring Cyprian north, if you like, or, or, or that he uses to come north, like, like Dracula and Whitby. Um, there's uh, the, uh, the medieval bestseller, uh, Legenda Aurea, uh, or the Golden Legend, as we should probably call it. We don't call things uh, uh, by their names. <laughs> Who speaks Latin anymore? Anyway? Well, and, and, unless you're talking about Marx's Das Kapital, yeah. which insists on being called that. Yeah, the Golden Legend, yes. Right, right, the Golden Legend, uh, in, which is compiled in 1260, um, and it's based on earlier works of Dominican monks. Um, so we have that in, in Italy, which is a, a very early um, uh, kind of recirculation of the story of uh, Justina and Cyprian. Uh, and then between 1470 and, and, and 1500, exactly after this kind of explosion of printing, um, the texts uh, get you know more prints than the Bible, as, uh, as Johannes points out uh, in, in, in our book. And uh, it's translated into several languages at that point, including Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish. And... Um, uh, I, I should say that's Johannes uh, Garbeck, who we're very pleased to have in, in the anthology, who is charting exactly uh, the, the, the Cyprianic books or, or, or Cyprian, uh, this, the, the, the Cyprianus or Cipriani, um, this kind of genre or uh, way of referring to books, the, the, the black books, the Schwarterbock. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, well, I, I've been telling the Scarlets, begging them for years to get someone to do a um, sort of bio-available golden legend because it's kind of like this, um, what do you call it? I view it as a flare or something kind of dropped into a cave because you can kind of illuminate uh, about a century or so because it was more popular than the Bible. And these are the stories that people knew offhand, cultural references that we would use today to do, you know, if you say, may the force be with you to someone, you understand the context and, and where that word yeah. comes from. And it's kind of the key to unlock how some of this shows up. Because where I, where I wanted to go in between, I guess, the commencement of the previously named Dark Ages to the appearance of the books in the kind of Scandi footprint, the the kind of, his Ikea phase, um, <laughs> <laughs> we have evidence that these stories are, thanks to, you know, a, a lack of literacy, that we, we can make the reasonable assumption that these stories were um, well-known uh, oral tales of different saints and different kind of stories about, you know, dragons underneath Rome and, and all that kind of stuff that you find in the Golden Legend. And then we have, and this is the bit, because I, I kind of want to talk about this and, and get your opinion on, on where you land. Uh, we have people like Trithemius mentioning the sort of books that are a Cyprian book, uh, which yeah. is a tantalizing indication, or the sort of practitioners that are Cyprianic, which is a tantalizing indication that uh, there was something in, in the evidence gap uh, before they do start to show up in, in, in a northerly direction that shows that they, these, these were the kind of... Um, yeah, these were the uh, back alley dentists, if you will, potentially <laughs> of uh, <laughs> of the grimoire world at the time. So, shall we talk about that and speculate on that? Right. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think when we end up looking at these tantalising references, we're looking at Trithemius. We're also looking at uh, someone very dear to my heart, Friar uh, Roger Bacon, uh, not to be confused with the later Francis. Um, and they both mention uh, books of, of Cyprian. And, and, and later on you'll get um, lots of people copying uh, Agrippa's list, and Agrippa is, is obviously copying it from other people as well, uh, of, of you know, big lists of um, not just the names of uh, infernal texts, but also the authors and the attributed authors. And there's a lot spent uh, uh, talking about how um, not only are people that are searching for these books um, evil, they're also idiots because they're often attributing works. One of the defences of, of Bacon who gets accused of being a necromancer um, after he dies uh, is um, that he writes a book on necromancy and, you know, 
uh, his defenders say, "Oh, this is this is to to to, to decry it, to explain why it's you know folly and and and, and heresy and whatnot." Uh, but that you know his uh, his idiot supporters, uh, according to this particular polemic, uh, conclude that because it's on necromancy, it must be uh, teaching it. Um, not to mention, of course, that by the 15th century you do get a, a certain breed of what, uh, what Owen Davies, for example, calls uh, Baconian necromancy. So these books attributed to him, which I think is a, a fascinating process and maybe something we talk about later, what uh, uh, Kierkefer calls the, the inverse hagiography, how these, uh, mm. these necromancers start not only sharing uh, legends, but uh, that uh, the, the gravity of the grave starts pulling otherwise um, respectable uh, magicians and occult philosophers into this realm of, well, you know, he was up to some, some dodgy business as well. Um, so I think when we're looking at Trithemius and uh, Bacon's references to Cyprian, one of the things that, that I find particularly fascinating uh, uh, is that uh, he's heavily linked, or one of the ways in which we can start getting at this is that he's heavily linked to these four principal spirits or four principal devils, as they're also called, or four spirits of the directions, or even four kings. Uh, the Book of Four Kings is one of the things that uh, supposedly Bacon attributes to, uh, to Cyprian's authorship. And so I think, uh, especially when we compare that to the fact that uh, the Book of Cyprian uh, is said in, in, in De Nigromancia, for instance, to also be called the Book of the Offices of Spirits, which itself is a, a, like most grimoires is a, a genre or a subgenre of, of grimoires. When we look at the, the, what we have of, of the surviving uh, books of Offices of Spirits, uh, one of which is contained within uh, the, the Folger manuscript VB26, which has been republished relatively recently as the Book of Oberon, and we see that there are four principal spirits. They are arranged very neatly in the directions, and they're uh, a set of spirits that I feel have been rather overlooked, both for their uh, operative utility in conjuration and also in the the story of Cyprian. Yeah, and we're in which you mentioned in your article because I I, I kind of want to come around to in the book um, Johannes is not completely convinced of the kind of Owen Davis contention that the uh, Svartbogen emerged from Germany and, and in a kind of northward direction up into eventually the Nordics. Uh, he yeah. suggests that there is, and it's the classic absence of evidence uh, problem because he, he makes a good case without textual evidence because that's how history works, uh, <laughs> that... Uh, you have that kind of Benedictine movements which could bring these ideas in, which makes sense to me. I mean, the, the, we owe a lot of these books to the Carolingian Renaissance, which was exclusively around... Uh, well, we owe a lot of the structure of this kind of stuff to the only places where there was, again, to use the Dark Ages thing, where there was light, which was in the kind of um, monastic economy, if you will. So that that kind of stuff makes sense to me. But I'm just wondering if you think, like, where do you land on the? Well, it could have been there beforehand, or it was a, uh, it was a German direction. And by the time Cyprian starts appearing in in books in Scandinavia, he has already accrued this reputation as being uh, the patron saint of Jake Stratton Kent's other magicians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think. There's actually a material component to this because in Johannes's piece, he does talk about paper not being um, common, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in that sense, I think, you know, when we talk about evidence in oral tradition, it does get problematic because if there's a culture that typically doesn't have or value paper and there's still talk, um, how can you, you know, it's like we can never really know, so we can speculate, but it's also that, you know, the technological means of transmission um, prohibit us from f- fixing anything, um, and there's almost a material bias in a way. Absolutely. That's absolutely where I, where I, th- I think we should think about these things. It's been, and funny enough, what I like about this book, and it's uh, use of multi-languages to kind of get people's heads around uh, the sort of polyvalence of St. Cyprian is this is how we do, this is how this kind of research or work needs to be done because it, it needs to use evidence and be aware of the limitations of evidence. Because I think, Jen, you're right. Uh, Owen Davies was did the correct thing of, of following 
you know, pieces of evidence uh, yeah. that we do have north. But if you look at and where I want to take the conversation next is the difference between the kind of end user of a of a Cyprian book in Scandinavia is quite different to the end user of a Cyprian book in the Iberian kind of world and then further off into the new world. And I think that supports Johannes's case a bit that um, if the even if the books or, or the kind of patron saint of other magicians sense came up from Germany later, it, it kind of hit an existing awareness of Cyprian because obviously the golden legend, the stories of that um, certainly made it to the north. You have a, a, a whole bunch of them. So I think you kind of have, I think he's right. And this is where I want to take the conversation. You have a wash of actual texts into existing cultures where they already knew what Cyprian was. And I think that's one of the challenges with trying to get people's heads around what Cyprianus are in, in the North. But that's my, that's my thoughts. Um, comments, questions, feedback. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go on. Take it away. <laughs> well, that, that was the response I got. I mean, this is the, there's a very lengthy, it's and a brilliant piece about it because it's kind of one of the inevitably under examined because of just time and money, uh, parts of the the Cyprianic journey is is the, the part in the north and for me that's I, I think Johannes is really onto something that it, it kind of hit a tradition but does someone want to maybe talk about who the end user of a uh, of a book of Cyprian would be in the north because I think this is where his case is quite strong oh sure yeah yeah I mean um, uh, one of the things that I, I like just as um, uh, to, you know to, to uh, get to are you still fanboying if you edited them uh, I don't know one of the things I liked about <laughs> Uh, Johannes's piece that he is that he, he and, and you see it in a lot of his, his other work and his trolldom work as well is that he's he's going through these uh, you know these folk spells and he's being and he's he's drawing together a, a, a sense of who these people are that, that that do this stuff by what they want and what they're after and some of the things he does is go through the lists of the the spells that these uh, uh, it seems mainly men um, were, were were doing with these things they were you know people that were interested in. Um, you know, uh, very particular uh, kinds of knowledge to be to be to be generated and tested about um, potential partners, about uh, strangers that they might meet, which is also part of a wider uh, Scandinavian uh, tradition of uh, of uh, uh, shall we say um, uh, kind but suspicious hospitality um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a land of uh, you know um, uh, very established uh, farmsteads of you know quite far apart um we're seeing uh, a kind of uh, folk magical uh, practitioner um yes it's not of, just men it's the kind of men your mother warns you about <laughs> <laughs> right there you have gambling you have the like by the end of it as we sort of in, hit the sort of beginnings of the 19th century the the northern cyprian focus of enchantments is um you know, out of wedlock sex, gambling, protection from thieves, a, a kind of, um, yeah, a, a bad boy farmer who obviously loves his family and, I don't know, livestock, but also likes to, you know, head out and maybe have some fun. And uh, and it's, a, it's very male in its uh, focus. Yeah, right. the gender fault lines here are pretty impressive when you look at the breakdown between Johannes's piece and what Jose brings. Well, exactly. So um, actually, we'll do that because the next one, I, I, let's go. So instead of north, let's head generally west from Antioch and, and head to Iberia. And we'll start with that. By the time we start to see texts attributed to or associated with Cyprian once in Iberia, uh, talk us through the, the different kind of gender expression we find in Cyprian magic there. Do you want to hit on that a little bit, Jen? Not especially. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, you were talking about end users, and I think that the Iberian tradition has the more more, more potential for female end users, whereas in the North there seems to be none. Um, and I thought that that was a very fascinating line that was drawn, as well as um, echoes of Justina in the Iberian world more than in the North because um, there were zero up there. So, you know, the, the balance is definitely skewed the higher up you get towards the poles of the earth. 
And certainly, I think uh, Johannes even starts his, his article with that assertion that there is no historical cult of Cyprian and Justina as, as saints in the church, despite heavy influence of, of uh, orthodox iconography and, and, and other things going in. But he does arise as a patron of, of magic books. So there, there has been a suspicion by many that, of course, maybe this means that it's coming from other sources inward in that way. But Iberian models of how a family works allows for older women to collect books of magic and therefore run the home altars because this is Spanish full Catholic tradition. So to, to slip pieces of paper into the, the Bible that you have that have things on them, um, this, is, this is just very common. But who holds the family Bible that is also holding the money and things like that as well is, is an old woman. So there is, there's an immediate uh, difference of of polarity and who can work these things. Now, a man might be trained, but there's also the the assertion in a lot of Iberian uh, tradition that a man who is trained in magic is not fully male. Um, so there's a there's that side of it too. Um, and this, I mean, it's it's reflected in the enchantments. You you have uh, a very classic folk magical enchantment of essentially Cyprian, show me the man I'm going to marry. It's it, that isn't mm-hmm. found in the north, but that's yeah very classic, you know, for the time, quote unquote, female magic. And I, yes. I find that interesting because it is in, uh, as, as we head into Iberia and out, uh, their, their afterlife gets, you know, they go from kind of crime fighting to some sort of uh, Scooby-Doo, Lord of the Rings, you know, they're, they're, out, they're out on boats, they're doing this amazing stuff, traveling the ocean. And yeah. you know, uh, that sort of Iberian afterlife of, of Cyprian is it, it's, it's very different to what we see going north. Right, right, and I th- I wonder it's and I'm, I'm I'm I think I'm I'm wildly speculating here, but I wonder if the 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 the, the boat thing because this is found in uh, in all sorts of the Iberian stuff about uh, certainly Cyprian going on a great boat journey over the waves, uh, and we have we can do an awful lot of you know. Um, I think it's useful to do the symbolic stuff, but I also wonder about uh, linking up and the, the the conflation of of Justina of uh, of Antioch and Justina of Padua, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 if we're seeing you know uh, extra strands to her bow uh, as as a result of that, I don't think it's just you know oh they've they've got the same name they must be they must be the same person. I I, I think there is a, a some sense of of understanding that. You know, uh, if if you've got travel involved between these two things, then there's then there's also some link uh, potentially occurring. And I also think that's maybe something more widely to talk about the the different uh, gender foci uh, in in the Iberian uh, material. Well, go for it. <laughs> hmm. I was thinking of other things when you were. So was I. I was thinking about the ocean. <laughs> yeah, well, I was all, I, to extend that further, I think right. there's also there's the, the 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 memory and the discussion of these things that happen that are often posthumously accredited. Right. In in so it's important also. Just I know that this volume is focusing on old world, and you know our our next one will uh, answer hopefully a little bit of of the riddles of the new world there. But the idea that. Um, 1492, big year, right? So mm-hmm. whole hemisphere discovered and Spain kicks out anybody who's heretic, Jewish, or Muslim and and this and seizes their property and says, go over here. So you get instantly uh, into what became New Spain centered around Mexico and the Caribbean heretic families that believed things differently and promoted um, something far away from the eyes of the church. So the magicians that arose here were already in a different way, but there is lots of talk of coming from across the waters because of the peninsulare reflex to look back home. And this constant thing of that home is even across the Mediterranean for a Catholic, that ultimately, although there's Rome, there's still beyond it, that the Holy Land is beyond that. Um, because crossing that water is a, is a huge thing. It's the reason that Santiago de Compostela was considered um, as equal to Jerusalem because he didn't have to leave the comforts of Western Europe to go do a big pilgrimage. He didn't have to cross the water. And even the saints coming across the water, the saints could have left by land, but they always leave by boat from the Holy Land. Mary Magdalene arriving to France and going this side and Lazarus arriving to France from across the waters. Um, so there's obviously this this something there. In in, in Mexican permutations, you're getting a, uh, an instance of almost an uh, assumption-like qualities of the sky and the ocean being the same. So the blue of virginity there, and this is it—is it—is she rising on a cloud ship 
across the waters this way? Is she coming down from heaven, from the oceans of the sky, the firmament waters there? Mm. So I think it's um, – there's I, a lot of fantastical – Yeah, I think that's uh, uh, very likely to be, like, correct. I think that's – what the ocean and ocean travel is. The other part of it, which I was kind of heading on, and it, it does move into the new world, is if you look at why, say, for instance, Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea was associated with Glastonbury, you have when you were kind of founding uh, an area, you need a connection to authenticity. And one of the good things about people arriving by boat is that you don't have to kind of tell the story of how they otherwise got to, like Magdalene getting like to utopia. the south of France. Exactly. So you, you have a, a way of... Uh, connecting to a sense of authenticity which is they showed up on a boat and and that journey is it kind of is typologically as you just discussed jesse uh the it it's from elsewhere and this coming from the sky and coming from the water is 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 a uh blended mystic idea but you also have a, a kind of when you when they start to get on boats you see a kind of a, a movement of cosmology and and a kind of looking backwards that you mentioned, and I think that's quite important. Mm. Yeah, I mean there there is the, the conflation. Even if I want to go on the extended um, wandering uh, wormhole here, uh, but the idea of carrying home with you and being able to carry possessions, the last, the, the two things you could take with you when you flee onto a boat, is a common feature of many saint stories of many things of going. So it, taking the last little bits of seeds that you could from your home garden or whatever it is, or a plot of earth going forward. I, I think it's interesting in this way. It's also because the Iberian, and this is my own personal agenda. I'm so sorry, but it's going to be a big part of my mindset of looking at Catholic inherited versions of these stories versus Protestant inherited versions of these stories. And pers and my proposal um, is that in countries where Catholicism was not rejected against, rebelled against, um, there was no reformation in that way until recently, Latin America especially, um, there's no uh, need to uh, dismiss the stories and the fantastical natures of miracles. Um, there's nothing before it. The world was always Catholic, even if it was something else, called something else before that. The Catholicism is the universal shell in which all these things exist. So it's not a question of pagan or Christian so much as just it had happened. Um, you know, miracles are a different thing. And the Northern feel for me in, is <laughs> colder is such a strange word to say because it literally is colder in the North, but it's <laughs> colder. Um, the, the, the worship of saints is a different thing there. The quality of Christianity in Northern Europe is very different than in hot climates. Mm. And this type of, of looking at, um, if, if there's not examining, I guess, as there's, um, cognitive linguistics and, and uh, different uh, social linguistics, things that you would examine. We don't always look at this with spirituality, with saint cults and things like this, the way that we perhaps should. And there should be an examination of the gun germs and steel of, of saints, right. um, especially in these cultic practices where you have an official thing of like just a feast day and a local custom. And then we're looking at the, the supplantation of value centers of this culture has a fishing deity that is being supplanted very specifically by the church. So it uses a fishing saint and that cult's expression becomes something completely linked into something thousands of years older. And it, the same saint somewhere else has something else, but its link is fish. It's not the saint that's truly the link, the historical saint, its link is fish. And, and that side of it becomes um, hotly debated still to these days of, of, of what exactly is the saint and what exactly is worthy of worship and what is their historical thing that is the real saint versus what it has become. And know, well, that's a larger your, your thoughts a step deeper that links back into what we had just discussed before. The fish isn't just a fish either. The fish is a material uh, emanation of a certain kind of practice because if the fish is what they eat there versus say, you know, a kind of plant or a different type of animal, you know, then it becomes this cultural mythology that gets built yes. into these religious practices. Whereas also just the ocean in um, medieval and Renaissance Iberia is very different than the ocean for Scandinavia, right? They, they did have water travel, but water travel wasn't necessarily built into the way that they lived their lives in the same way that it was for someone in Portugal. Quite. For sure. Yeah. Um, and, and forgive me for shorthanding, but when I, when I use the term value center, I'm referencing the, the uh, was it radical monotheism in Western culture? The idea that, uh, that the value centers, the, the ideas around which a society coalesces and develops its prominent figures of worship those must be kept intact. In order for true conversion to happen, the symbol sets, there must be something to replace it. 
if it does not meet those standards, it will be rejected by the society. So therefore, fish only means fish to what that, exactly what you're saying, that fish to that village and how they operate is the thing that's actually manifesting there, not just fish on a universal scale. It's like it becomes this dream interpretive thing that it, we can get lost in of like, well, the cat means something to some person and it means something else to somebody else. But the saint still has a cat. So we both find a vehicle in the saint in, in working this way. Right. Well, actually, this is great because I was going to solve, uh, well, not solve, I was going to pose this thorny question towards the end because uh, I think you're right. And, and one of the ways to kind of potentially rephrase that is that uh, any kind of version of animism is inherently sort of biosphere specific. So when you are talking about a fish, it's... Uh, a fish, fish. Is, yeah, exactly. A fish <laughs> is constructed in a very specific cultural context, which I think we... Um, so this is the question. Uh, how do we navigate the, uh, in a best practice way, how do we navigate the necessary uh, return to prominence of Cyprian in the sort of history of the Western magical tradition, as well as its never went away livingness in, in, in parts of the new world? How is the best, what is the best practice way of, uh, of, having both these things happen at once. Well, if you figure that out, let me know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think this book is a, an attempt to answer that question because Agreed. one of the things that I contributed to this uh, volume, I'm, I'm not as versant in the practice of Cyprian and Justina as Jesse and Al are, but they came to me because collectively we had this vision of the kind of polyvalence that you enjoyed and preparing people with materials where they can investigate for themselves in the target language and in translation to see juxtaposed against one another how different people have interpreted different things and somehow through that work of combing through and reading and exposing oneself to traditional practices outside of one's own preferred frame, I think then you can approximate you know, maybe not in terms of revising your own personal practice, but at least doing due diligence in terms of knowing where you come from and where you're situated. And so I always try to be careful when people think of transmission like something has emerged on Earth in one place and then has this teleological pursuit and somehow infects the world <laughs> like a bacteria. Um, <laughs> mutations occur and, and translations and spontaneous occurrences also occur to create multiple Cyprians, um, and so there's no need, or even multiple Justinas, within various forms of cultural practice, so that there doesn't need to be a kind of direct, oh, and went to Germany, and then it went to Scandinavia, and then it came back to, you know, Portugal. It's sort of like, it's allowed to exist in the polyvalence simultaneously throughout space and time, and that it's just a matter of kind of orienting yourself in all of those Oh, yeah. that was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> that was exactly, uh, you said it, obviously, so much better than I could. That is exactly And that's the what... vision for this book, actually. Well, I think but... it succeeds. Yeah. I, I really do. I think um, the sensitivity, and it's, it's languages, I mean, you know, my ancient Greek isn't as good as it could be, uh, but... Uh, Shame. Yeah. <laughs> Shame. Yeah. <laughs> uh, having having the words there and then obviously having the English words there, there is a sensitivity to the idea that uh, for some people who, for some people who are coming from a, people will get a different thing out of this book, potentially from a new world and certainly in the next volume, uh, from a new world angle I, angle, I speculate there's an element of family treeing to something, your family treeing someone who's alive uh, from, I have, you know, obviously much more of a, um, northwest european grimoire background uh, and for me there's an element of doing up a house rather than uh, doing a family tree because it's about working out which things we, and it's it's an oversimplification but it work, it's about working out what we might sort of allow to fall into uh, a solomonic tradition rather than a cyprianic tradition from an historical perspective for northwest europe and i love that this book manages to deal with uh, competently deal with the yeah the history of it within uh, with an awareness that in different parts of the world it's not actually a history it's it's alive it's a it's a fish it's a Mexican fish as well as being <laughs> a thing that happened five hundred years ago in Denmark. Yeah. Right. Right. Those fishes appear a lot though. I'm telling you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can I quote you on that? This book is a Mexican fish. Yes, absolutely. 
We'll, Great. We'll put Perhaps it, my put favorite it. review. <laughs> <laughs> this book is the uh, best Mexican fish <laughs> you will ever have. Um, so actually, often, um, deceptively often mentioned in Mexican Christmas carols at that. So, um, <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, it is, I think you, Jenny was a far more eloquent answer than my stammering is going to attempt at right now. I think for us, a lot of this, this, this question of how do I, how do we, how do we observe these traditions that are now exposed to each other in the, in the great leveling of the internet? <laughs> um, my relationship with Al has been based on this continuing conversation, <laughs> which turns into we're, you know, at a conference talking about other things, but still go into this constant, but what about this? And no, not this. No, no, no. Really? What about, okay. And then we, um, unfortunately, and fortunately bring our friends into it. And this includes Jen of, so here's an idea for a book. And we think this is a good idea because basically, um, you get tired of, tired of being the authority on something in the room. Maybe that's really hubristic to say, but like when you've read five books and the other person hasn't read one, you're just like, oh, but I want to talk about the books. You can't have the conversation with the person that hasn't read the books. Right. And um, Al's read 50,000 books and I've read five. So um, the arguing and the, in, in the truest classical debate sense of argument right. is astounding. And that feeding that comes from that is what inspires this type of looking at right, right, right. The difference between, you know, even coming from a, a vaguely, you know, necromantic perspective of, well, look at the history of, of all this early modern stuff before, the, you know, before the Enlightenment screws everything up. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I get the answer of, well, I think you'll find if you go to Mexico City and, you know, look for a, an old lady doing this kind of thing, then there's something that looks incredibly similar. Yeah. And, and again, this isn't about, you know, saying that... Uh, Mexican fish. Right. It's Mexican fish again, yeah. Uh, oh. And getting to see uh, uh, living traditions, plural, uh, next to unliving ones, shall we say. And uh, making, making the, the evidences or the, the roads into those things bioavailable. And uh, also there's, you know, there's a certain special something about uh, you know, a patron of, of magical texts mm -hmm. uh, being given in those, in those languages. And, uh, and the magical experimentation should not be, uh, I think, underestimated in terms of, uh, mm -hmm. well, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of writing Greek on bay leaves, so uh, here's a bunch of Greek for you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's make the awkward question even a little bit more awkward then. Yeah, you mentioned, yeah, there's a living one and an unliving one, which is a nice match for, as you say, a kind of necromantic Northwest uh european flavor how do we make uh how do we make the dead undead what's the best way of doing that because you kind of know where i'm going with this <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um well uh mm. if it's if it's not too much to 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 seek uh, uh one of my uh, parallel and, uh, and, and related uh, passions is the, as we've talked about before, is the, uh, the excellent book of the art of magic and its attendant scrying records, uh, The Visions, which is contained in additional manuscript 36674 in the British Library. And uh, this is a, a fascinating example of, of, of uh, a classic, uh, you know, uh, conjurer uh, and um, uh, scryer uh, operation uh, conducted 20 years before uh, D and Kelly, my friends of D and Kelly, who are operating in a very classical, uh, a very, well, a very uh, classic early modern uh, conjuration method. These, uh, you know, proud Englishmen who will go off to become uh, explorers until post colonialism decides to call them, um, you know, murderers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> quite rightly. Um, they are doing, uh, you know, the kind of uh, conjuration that might start to look quite familiar to, to, to grimoirists, where they, they start with a a chief of, uh, of, of hell, and crucially not simply a chief of hell, but a, a ruler of the dead and a keeper of the dry bones. And after them, they uh, go through an intermediary, and through that intermediary, I'm going down the, the conjuration hierarchy here, they hit the four, they hit, the, they hit Oriens, they hit the, 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 the primary of the four regions. And uh, Oriens is asked to bring books, uh, the best book ever written, actually, uh, they are not. I mean, if you're going to do it, right? They are not. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, they are not burdened with uh, an overabundance of humility. <laughs> um, and this, uh, you see, this the way this this cycle works of uh, summoning spirits to bring you books to learn how to summon better spirits to get better books, etc. Uh, you see the uh, the the the, <laughs> the viscous cycle. 
of uh, this ink <laughs> flow this ink cool. shed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and you follow the ink. And, uh, you know, personally, I think uh, we, we, we very much need to, as Jen has already said, orient ourselves. Um, <laughs> See what you did there. <laughs> and I think this is, this is a very vital part of it. Um, and, uh, and, and you yourself, Gordon, uh, I think are, uh, you know, swept up into this in, uh, in chaos protocols. Uh, you've, 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 uh, you've got some, some regent work in there. Yeah, that was, an, uh, that was hiding the vegetables in the kids' food. Uh, <laughs> That yeah. you'll actually see that in all three of the books. That um, fish, yeah, <laughs> hiding the vegetables in the kids' food beside the fish fingers, but, yes. uh, which I think is all we get if uh, at this point in time. But I, I guess the question I wanted to, well, the, the the kind of pain point in that question was around cultural sensitivity, which is how we bring the dead undead in Northwestern Europe when there's a living thing across the ocean. And I guess for me, it seems like, and I'll get you to talk about this, Dr. Al, and then we'll, we'll have feedback, feedback. What even is the manner of St. Cyprian? Right. Well, this is, um, this is the, 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 the title of my chapter and it's, 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 it's taken from, um, from someone speaking on, um, the kinds of things that were, or that were attributed to him, and and again we're into this he- inverse hagiography. So, when when necromancers accrue this historical and historiographical weight of the things that start being attributed to them specifically, that might be far older than that specific individual, whether or not that individual was ever his historical actor or or, or not, um, then. You know, this starts to warp the 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 the, the, the fabric of, of of the of, of both myth and and history. And when this is occurring, we're, we're looking at <clears throat> a variety of things. Uh, the the manner of Cyprian becomes what our early modern ancestor uh, magicians and occultists, uh, occult philosophers, uh, folk magicians, folk necromancers were pulling out of these earlier accounts which themselves are pulling together from these things. And the, we almost get the idea of the Cyprianic manner as this inertia of a necromantic method. Um, and in, in that case, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's, you know, it hasn't stopped either, <laughs> crucially. Uh, I think you see Cyprian popping in and out in, in the English language stuff, which I'm, I'm more versed in, like the yew tree, you know, which can root its branches and is kind of uh, amphibious in that sense of, of, of disappearing underground, and you know, the, the, the clerical underground is a, is, is a good example of that, and then reappearing again and flourishing again. And we see it with these little traces of Cyprian appearing again in um, the Folger Book of Magic, that's, as I've been republished as the Book of Oberon. We get him in, in prayers. We get instructions from Cyprian at the very start of Sloan Manuscript. <coughs> Uh, 3851, I think it is, uh, which has been republished as uh, the, the Grimoire of Arthur Gauntlet, where they're almost, as I say, I think they're almost so, so common sense that people overlook them. They're not, you know, draw this particular circle, but they are, you know, maybe don't talk about, you know, your necromancy except to people who, you know, understand what you're on about. <laughs> and I don't just think this is, obviously, I, you know, I've, I've, I've ranted a lot about ritual secrecy in, 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 in Goetic Operation. Um, I think it's not just a practical thing about not getting burnt at the stake. I mm. think there is something sorcerously operative about not talking about some stuff. Um, and uh, I realise the irony of, of banging on constantly <laughs> about the importance of secrecy. But these, uh, you know, these aren't the only things that these instructions of Cyprian uh, offer uh, and were, were copied down in this in this working book. I should say, if people aren't familiar with the, I guess it's called the Grimoire of Arthur Gauntlet. It's a uh, it's it's I mean he copies out the entire of the Aban, attributed pseudo uh, uh heptameron, uh, for instance. So there are grimoires within it, but it's also it's also your, your notebook that you, you, that you're copying things down into because you don't know when you know you're going to get this book again. So it's it's a collection of all sorts of things. And the very start of it, uh, I think, around with the with the aphorisms, the isogog, is uh, is the instructions of Cyprian, and he, he keeps cropping up in these little bits of of, of the the prayers. Um, it crops up in terms of the attribution of various books that books uh, are talking about. So the, the, the De Nigromancia, which, funnily enough, is also found in additional manuscript 36674, as well as a Sloan uh, Latin copy. 
Um, it's found in, in English, which is also interesting in of itself, where, you know, maybe not this book, the, 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 the Dinic Romancer itself, which is attributed to ha, Roger Bacon, uh, the, 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 the cast start to look familiar now. Uh, the, the rogues gallery uh, is, is this kind of uh, familiar cavalcade. Uh, the, the, also, the, 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 the book that inspires the book or the book that you are meant to have along with this book teaching you how to make the book is somehow a book of Cyprian or attributed to him and associate itself with the book of Offices of Spirits, which will then gives you your spirit catalog, these things you're working with. So the manner of Cyprian starts to be this thing that you can kind of discern less as a set of, um, uh, you know, this is, uh, while there are, while I would say there is a, a, a favoured spirit catalog, uh, it's not, you know, this, this entirely new uh, purple one true Cypriana. It's a way of looking at the material and gathering together bits and pieces that might not have looked cohesive uh, to cohere around uh, this this operation of of of, of uh, consulting with uh, dead magicians which we also find as one of the very uh, cornerstones of the, the 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 operations of gilbert and davies which gets written down as their excellent book of the art of magic uh, and various other forms of a spirit work informed by um, orienting yourself in the landscape of working through the, the senior uh, figures that rule these spirits, which, uh, you know, Jake has been uh, banging that drum uh, now, uh, and I think people are starting to, to twitch to that rhythm, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, um, so to, I mean, if we put that in a sentence, maybe, it would be that the manner of St. Cyprian is a combination of... Uh, Worldview and not necessarily ritual structure, but approach to spirit structure that sits alongside and Venn diagrams, but doesn't overlap with a kind of classic Solomonic one. Right, right. Uh, you know, we can we can we can definitely pick out you know particular features of this kind of uh, operation. The, the bookishness of it, uh, uh, the, the the bookishness uh, becomes becomes crucial. Books to 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 find books. To, uh, to write better books, to receive better books from spirits. Um, so we're not just talking about a particular text as, as fetishized. We're talking about a way of approaching text, authorship, patronage, and, um, and contribution as well, that you, that you yourself are, 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 you know, are part of this thing. You're not, um, you're not doing things to the tradition. You're, uh, you're engaging with it as part of it. Yes, and I think uh, that's a really good way of kind of looking at because this comes back to the cultural sensitivity question I, I keep prodding at, which is for people outside the context, that um, getting your head around and experiencing the manner of St. Cyprian, if this is a kind of form that resonates with you, is step one, rather yeah. than... Uh, and then, you know, maybe in 100 years we can we can do comparison, but it, it, it seems like uh, one of the things that... I feel the book handled uh, sensitively because it it needs to be is is how yeah we restore Cyprian as a an historical mythological figure in in the Western tradition um, explore the quote unquote manner of Saint Cyprian and do this within with the awareness that uh, we're building something but there are parts of the world where it doesn't need to be built it's 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 never gone anywhere it's it, it's still alive and it's a really kind of interesting and uh if handled incorrectly delicate uh, area to kind of think and practice in and around mm. well thank you yeah i think the, the the goal was certainly to to be as sensitive as we could um and to um you know certainly not try as I said try and push you know the the one true way or uh, you know anything like that, and conversely from the or as in the uh, the the stuttering wow um, <laughs> how to formulate this thought uh, this is why is, we write books because it's very difficult to just kind of say it <laughs> I think for me too the the there is a certain amount of personal agenda in 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 approaching it at least I'm very happy that that is is. Um, something that you're picking up from in it and and the question of the dialogue there because it is a it is a sensitive subject especially when um there is often now there are many discussions that i see happening between uh the that which needs to be revived or that which is reviving versus that which is uh 
I won't say thriving for the sake of rhyme, um, <laughs> but <laughs> something that is uh, something that is there, um, and the 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 issues that surround, um, especially New World folk traditions, and 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 I would say Catholic Catholic diasporic, if that's even a that's a term now, um, because I, I do think there's a lot of this in in the Philippines as well, um, where there's this inheritance of colonization, Spanish colonization, and Portuguese colonization, that. Um, Catholicism is a really wonderful blob monster of agglutinizing thing, of agglutinating things to its cause. Oh, it's bulging. And, yeah. um, you know, I think it's important um, for understanding how Christianity manifested in this hemisphere to understand that even the early attempts were to convert were done in a way that had not been done in Europe. And that was to learn the language of those you are converting. So if you are receiving Christianity for the first time as an indigenous person in Central America and the Franciscans learned your language, they don't describe the new religion to anything as anything new to you. They use your God names. They're your sacred sites, your names. So you are not converting. You are merely adding. And this sets a precedent for Latin American Christianity that is not what happened in Europe. There is no replacement. Uh, there is merely adding. So things get shifted around in this way. And in a similar way, those people that brought grimoires to oh, the northeast of Brazil that have 400 more pages in them than the published versions of Europe, hmm. where did those 400 pages come from? How old are they? Are they written in the same style? Well, no, because they're all notes. Right. So where do we go with this? Is it, is it, is it African spirit cult influence? Is it indigenous and Caribbean, Caribbean Indian influence? Well, who knows? But we have 400 years of a book being there. We know that it derives from some text somewhere 400 years ago, and you can attribute it to certain families, just as you said, a family tree. There, there, there are certain names that are thrown around in certain circles that if you're descended from one of those families, it's like having royal blood because they brought the book. They brought the book. Whatever the book is. I don't know what the book is, but I know that they brought the book. <laughs> so I, I think this conversation from, from this, because I'm coming at it from the other way of, of being very interested in the European things because it, 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 it is an inheritance for, for the children of the new world, for sure. But we have all these other things that are, that are not written text and the value of oral text and physical text and is this different lightness of transmission that are often completely um, thrown aside except when actually, they kind of uh, yeah, flare I just ask, Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, that's one reason why hooking on to that is that um, in the next volume of this we are going to be having more interviews. And one reason why we included an interview in the first one was because we wanted to give life to that form of textual transmission because there are cultures that do not prize the same evidence base that a text, right? You're talking about this material transmission of a book and a text and this kind of, I, I want to say literacy, but I think that's also even misleading because oral cultures are also literate. They're just literate differently. And so this interview form we're going to see a lot more of that in the next volume uh, because there are cultures that have robust knowledge that isn't fixed textually. And the only way to do justice to it sensitively is to interview people and let them say what they need to say, print it um, so that people who value textuality as such can read it and finally take it, their word for it. But in a way um, it's that fine meeting point between two different kinds of um, valuing knowledge, you know, and so what Jesse's coming from, like, that's a really important facet of what's going on here. Right. I think it does influence the, the, uh, God, backwash is not the term I'm looking for. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the tides going, let's use a tidal metaphor, I suppose. Um, but changing the concept of how, and this is a product of my postmodern NYU training. I'm so sorry for that. But the idea of looking at what a text is and, and looking at the kind of linguistically, come on, the, the word for altar and book are the same in many indigenous languages. That How do you translate what they brought? It's an altar because it's storing the memories of your religion. It's storing the memories of your people. But our physical altar is now called book by some of those languages as well. And I love this metaphor of ink shed, um, that, that, that the saint who bleeds ink is a personal epithet for me, for Cyprian, for many years, because there is this eclipsing. How do you learn from a page through the eclipsing of it with ink? Um, so this is beautiful, especially going to, I mean, that's a whole tangent of Brazilian Kimbanda Cyprian stuff there and, and other things. And, it, you know, that's a love fest for days talking about that. <laughs> but I do think that there is this conversation that needs to happen that 
can't happen until there are interviews that we don't have source text to be able to talk about things. So the only right. way we can do that is to create one so that we right. can fight against it, tear it apart, interview other people, have people react against it. And there are not one of us agrees with everything that's in this book. The idea is to present it yeah. right. and start a discussion. And that to me is interesting. I mean, a series, even, even a book that's polyvalent in this way, but a series on one figure in this way is rarely if ever attempted. And so, you know, perhaps it's not to worry. It's not creating a golden legend that is, they then inspires every version of Saint Lore that you hear after that point. Mm. Um, and everything gets traced back to that to the point where when I find out like well, there's earlier versions of Saint Lore, that's amazing. Now there is another book of Cyprian, at least in that way, by acknowledging all those books that are out there. Because coming from a Mexican background, what I agree is the Book of Cyprian is not what the Brazilians agree, which is not what the, the Norwegians agree, which is not what the Swedish agree, which is not what necessarily what the Portuguese, the Spanish, or the Italians, or the Turks agree on what a Book of Cyprian is. Yeah. But put them all under one cover, <laughs> and I'm kind of forced to, uh, me personally, look at it in a different way. Yeah, and I think that's part of what a good, you know, a good uh, devotional work with, uh, you know, many spirits that are worth working with is going to produce. It's not all going to be, you know, candies and rainbow. Like this is going to be a bunch of stuff that you, you know, tensions that you need to, to address uh, and that we all address in, in doing that. And, you know, I don't think it's uh, overblowing the case to say that this book is a, is, is a devotional uh, act for, for, for us. And that's, mm-hmm. that's another reason why, uh, you know, I was very pleased that we had the, the interview with, with Zay uh, in that he is, you know, candidly reflexive about what it's like to, you know, what it was like to produce the sorcerers, uh, to, to, to translate and extensively comment on uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the sorcerer's treasures. Um, so I think having that there and having that sense of um, devotion will lead you to, uh, you know, places that not necessarily, I don't want to get, you know, masochistic about it, but that will, will lead you to places that are, uh, that are yeah, uncomfortable, that, that require you to, to exist in attention and require you to learn from it and <laughs> well, step up. Zay is a perfect example because it was the first time many people who are monolingual English speakers are familiar with a translation of a book of Cyprian. Mm-hmm. So if you are, have read these from childhood already, you have this, you, you know what this is. It's common folk magic bound into a volume. And then you get the people that are reading uh, that's how translation through Hadian of horribly disappointed that, that they're expecting some giant cosmology to be transmitted intact from the great saint himself. And to be fair, what? Zay was also horribly disappointed when he read it in Portuguese for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I mean, and that comes out in the interview as well. Is that you know he also had this idea that he calls it condensed fear. Really, you know. <laughs> And um, and then you actually engage with it, and and it changes you forever. You know, yeah. the so. page within the page is a common thing they talk about with Cyprian books of like, if I read the words right, maybe the letters will peel up, and the real words. It's totally Emperor's New Clothes. <laughs> like people that keep this pamphlet on their on their on their boela on their spirit altar, whatever it is, on their home shrine, expecting that someday the true one will manifest through it. Well, you've you've talked before about there are people that claim that the only true book of Cyprian is the one you dream. Yes. Right? So all of these other books are the way into that. Yeah. They're, they're, mm-hmm. the, they're the bed under the bed yes, in the box. Exactly. <laughs> that, that you can only see it by eclipsing your eyes mm. to view the eclipsed page. But right. Anyway. But there, to yeah. go back to some of your question or the thing that you brought up, Jesse, about um, there's a power differential. And that's one thing this book is trying to solve or this series of books is that there is power in ink shed and, and lack mm-hmm. of ink shed. And so one of the things the interview form helps us do is to give people who don't have that kind of literacy with ink shed, uh, a, a pathway to be literate to people who do. And it's not a matter of, you know, erasing their, it's not like we're trying to impose certain kinds of textuality on other people's. It's more like giving testimony in space right. to them, which is to be seen by people that don't normally know how to see in that way. Yeah. Which, which again, I think is, is, uh, on hopefully honoring the, the tradition we're, we're speaking on, uh, through you know Zay talking about the importance of that, this stuff is is is, is moved by desperation as much as it is by, uh, or, or far more than it is by you know idle curiosity or you know the desire to collect spooky books. Yeah, I mean in that constellation, the maleness is of a quite different character from the northern concerns that Johannes brings up and the concerns that Zay brings up. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. 
And I think, uh, I mean, this is exactly what what a book like this is supposed to do. And yeah, I did. I mean, I wasn't at NYU, Jesse, but uh, the the post structuralism is welcome here because that was that was me at Sydney, <laughs> and that's kind of where I was thinking. Because not only are we in a situation where we do have uh, living traditions that have a different relationship to ink shed, but we're also dealing with a form that has its own separate reality. So the idea that um, precisely the wrong way of doing it is to make sure none of the food on the plate touches. <laughs> because that's not correct either. That's why it's 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 challenging. And what I like about the book, it's it's difficult, and there are pain points because there are cultural sensitivities and and um, complexities to navigate. But nevertheless, they must be navigated because we're dealing with living traditions and living forms. And uh, the book does that really well. Well, I think it's also this is directly reflective of. Uh, the experience of of those of us that are stuck between those inheritances that how can I separate the blood that 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 is being of two three four cultures or two three four religious expressions in one family practiced simultaneously so it, and this is this is true for many people so when you get to the new world expressions of these things, I think there is an existing model there that is not not unwrapped as much in European praxis, per- perhaps because there's a separate, sep- 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 separation. Wow, <laughs> separation. Separation. Yeah, separation. This is <laughs> we'll define it later. Um, but the book, as a product of of these multiple things, has to explore that. If you are treating anything with, if we had disdain for our authors, maybe we could keep them separate, <laughs> <laughs> like a TV dinner. <laughs> but when you're really savoring what's coming out there is nothing more thrilling than to throw a first draft of something that I've received from anybody across the room and like, what is this? <laughs> um, I want to, we don't Al- put fish in the microwave, Jesse. That's, yeah. You know, <laughs> I want to throw Al across the room half the time because I love him so much <laughs> um, because of the challenging of these things and, and, and what is bound between a book and you can go into the, the metaphors that exist already within this cultic practice in certain places, but that the binding of the book is, this, is the male Cyprianic act and the bosom that feeds you are the pages when they are opened, and the ink, the milk that feeds you. And this is a very Cyprian Justina thing, which is also something as far as gender polarities and these things of, of from the beginning of Justina must be included. But when she's not included, it, she's notable noticed by her absence, which is also interesting too. Well, this, I mean, congratulations and congratulations to everyone who contributed to it. Uh, I, you know, the, I wasn't sure, like the interview with Jose was brilliant, but I thought maybe it was like having comics at the end of a book because he's funny as shit in that. <laughs> <as well>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, again, I mean, this has been a brilliant conversation. It is like the first one second of a, of a multi-decade uh, conversation. It's really exciting to see what can be done with this form and and hopefully um well we will definitely watch and see what happens with what the form does when it's uh when it's dropped into the world but uh dr al dr jen kind of dr jesse uh again (laughs) gordon Gordon, you haven't asked us the first question no 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 but you guys have to come back for that because i thought like i can't do like one i already know al's a weird kid but the other you guys have to come (laughs) back because uh we would have spent like half an hour talking about that. Ran okay. out, out of time to talk about Cyprian. But uh, again, we will definitely get you all back on in various different permutations and <laughs> uh, of guest multiples. Uh, again, congratulations on the book. Thank uh, you. And where you. would people go to actually get the book? Where's and and find out about you guys? Um, the book is available YouTube. at Rubido dot press so www.rubedo.press somewhat unconventional and we also today for the feast day released a uh, series of blank grimoires being hand bound by an alchemical talismanic bookbinder that will be available until october 7th limited edition um, dream books for people who want to actually engage with this material on their own way very cool so, and those books also come with uh, some, some particularly uh, potent oils as well, which you might want to introduce, Jesse, oh, quite briefly. Yeah, I made some oils. Um, <laughs> Fish oil? There, 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 are, there are oils being included that are, uh, there are will within the next, 
a series of feast days because we have the 26th here. We have the 2nd, which is the Orthodox feast day, and the 7th of October, which is the feast of Justina Padro, which is the, the saint that is conflated with Justina of Antioch. Um, there will be seven oils total, uh, three for Cyprian, three for Justina, and one for all three focusing through the, the martyr of Theophistus. Um, so uh, through Wolf and Goat, which is uh, a series of a decade of gathering recipes. Um, so focusing on uh, everything from New Worlds and uh, Iberian to uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, folking, focusing up into folking. Oh, today <laughs> is just all over the place. Uh, Greek and Turkish recipes that I was able to gather uh, through about 20 years of really trying to inquire and then 10 years of really realizing that I wanted to make the things that I was inquiring about. It took me 10 years to come to that conclusion. So, um, But, uh, yeah, the, the grimoires and the, the deluxe versions are available, but... Uh, it is an offering we, we, from the beginning. This this blank book is important to offer um, that that people may write. And this is this is the true. Stick the quill into the arm and write. Yeah, one of them is completely made out of goat as well. It's um, seventy two pages of vellum. Very cool. Good number seventy two. Yeah, mm. <laughs> I've heard. Yeah. So. Well, guys, thanks once again, and obviously all of this will be in the show notes. And congratulations on uh, on on yeah on an excellent project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ta-da! We made it through our first four-way podcast, largely unscathed and certainly better informed. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to the output of our various guests. A conversation such as this can only ever skim the surface. And what a conversation it was. Cyprian of the North, Cyprian of the New World, the changing role and status of St. Justina, the cross-cultural implications of this sort of work, the manner of St. Cyprian, Mexican fish, some shame, and a whole lot more. Please do get involved with the conversation on the blog or the RuneSoup Facebook page. Check out the books and oils by navigating the links below. Subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcatcher or on YouTube. And find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.